Hello and welcome to the Daniel and Revelation Prophetic Bible Study. We are on chapter 1 verse 1. So last three weeks we were doing some background study. Um, so today we will actually dive into uh, chapter 1. So this is session 4. If you are watching this session for the first time, I would rec and, uh, encourage you to go back and uh, uh, watch session 1, 2 and 3 that gives you a lot of background uh, for the book of Daniel. So from now on we'll be studying the actual material from chapter 1. So if you are watching this for the first time, I would encourage you to go back and watch session 1, 2 and 3. And if you like this series, please recommend this to a friend and also you may subscribe so you will be notified of the new uh, sessions whenever I post it. Uh, thank you. So last week I showed you a few slides from um, the ancient Babylon. This is a depiction of how the Babylon uh, was. Uh, so there you see the star gate and there were some archaeologists. So they found these uh, remnants of these walls and put in museums. Um, so and I also showed you the lions that uh, are on the walls of this procession street they call it. It's uh, so much uh, so many lions on the, the entire wall. So these are aurochs. I think I'm pronouncing it right. So it looks like these are extinct. This looks like a buffaloes uh, but looks also like a horse but uh, it has horns. Uh, so uh, Nebuchadnezzar has glazed all this uh, on the walls, lions and the aurochs and uh, all these on those uh, walls. Um, and here if you see this is a museum, they have this uh, uh, erected in the Berlin uh, in Germany. So and also we talked about uh, the structure of the book. Uh, let me quickly recap what we studied the last week. So this book is a bilingual book, meaning it has uh, two languages. It's uh, having a Hebrew and also it's also written in, written in Aramaic. So uh, chapter 1 verse 1 to 2, 4, it's in Hebrew and then it switches to Aramaic and then uh, it switches back to Hebrew in chapter 8. Chapters 1 to 6 is a history and then chapters 7 to 12 is a prophecy or visions. And one thing I mentioned last week was that these the chapters were not written in chronological order. So they are not written in chronological order. So I thought I will show you how the chronolo chronology works. So here this is what gives a clear uh, picture. You have the chapter 1 around 605 BC. It starts with Daniel's the deportation from Babylon, from Judah to Babylon. And then you have chapter 2, 3 and 4. And then Daniel had this vision chronologically that comes there. And then 7 and 8 and then the actual chapter 5. Then you, that is you are now going to the Persian Empire and then have the chapter 9 and then 6 and uh, the rest of the chapters. So, so just, just for your uh, uh, understanding like how these are all laid out. And uh, I also mentioned if you come across some different uh, years, so sometimes the years won't match properly. Uh, so don't get uh, worried about that. So the one year difference arises with other uh, Old Testament dates though the use, uh, through the use of um, methods of reckoning. So some people use different methodology and some people use it differently. So the years of a king's reign can be counted you know, from the new year before the actions and from the Accession uh, itself are uh, from the next year, so next new year. Okay, here is the uh, structure of the first chapter. I mean, so the first chapter is a kind of a, a chiastically structured. Some of you, those who took uh, my classes before, how to study the Bible, I explained what is this a chiastical structure. So Bible always uh, uh, employs this kind of a structure. So what it means is, let me quickly explain what it is. Is so if you look at 1a, starting at 1a, so that is the Babylonians defeat Israel. So it ends with, so if you look at the last line, that is 1b, it deals with Daniel sees out of Babylon. So they come out of Babylon. So comes into Babylon, comes out of Babylon. So 1a matches with 1b. So the next one is 2a. So these young men are taken for training. And then the young men are triumphant in the training 2b. So if you look at 2a and 2b. 
and then Daniel wants to avoid defilement and then he avoids the defilement. So if you match that. Uh, so it's basically a structure. So you can see how these arrows, I color coded it for your sake convenience. So 1A matches with 1B, 2A matches with 2B. Uh, sometimes it's more, so this kind of a chiastic structure you can also see in uh, uh, John, the Gospel of John. Um, I explained when I taught or, or that. So uh, it is very interesting to see how the writers uh, I don't think they put uh, a, a piece of paper and started, okay, I want to do this. I, but somehow these came into, it is mind-boggling to see these chaotic structures in Psalms, in the Gospels, in some places. So it's very interesting how this uh, uh, chaotically, uh, the structure works. But anyway, so it's, uh, uh, this is how it was laid out. So now we come back to Daniel chapter 1 verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Now, when we read this verse, when we open the Bible to Daniel and chapter 1 and verse 1, when you read this now with the background of all the three sessions that we had, now we know who is this Jehoiakim, right? So now we know who this Nebuchadnezzar is. Now we know all these places because we studied extensively in all the three sessions. So now it helps us to understand in the third year of Jehoiakim, that is when I told you that, you know, the Jehoiakim was a vassal king for Egypt at the time because Nebuchadnezzar won the battle at Carchemish. Now he comes here and then make Jehoiakim a vassal for him. him. So now uh, at that time, he what he did was he chose the top royal young people from his kingdom. He did not destroy the city. He did not burn the city or did anything like that, but just to install this Jehoiakim as a vassal king. And he, um, but he picked up a lot of uh, young people, uh, good looking and talented. I don't know. I think maybe he might have given some kind of uh, IQ test. Uh, but he picked up the brilliant young men. Uh, so that, that the reason for that is, he wanted to take them and brainwash and uh, adapt them into his Babylonian culture. So that is what he wanted to do. Uh, so that is what Daniel 1 verse 1. This is all studied in last week's class. And so now uh, here is the three deportations. So the first one is 605. Uh, that's when Daniel and his friends uh, were taken to Babylon. And uh, when Jehoiachin was there, so at that time, uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar summoned him to Babylon. At that time, there were around 10,000 uh, people were taken captive and taken to Babylon. So Prophet Ezekiel was there in the second batch. And in the third deportation, when Zedekiah rebelled against uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, he was so mad, so he burned the city, he burned, he destroyed the temple, he almost took everybody captive, uh, but uh, pretty much the land was desolate. We can see that what happened during those uh, uh, desolations. Um, so, and the, the second verse, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand uh, with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, uh, to the house of his God, and he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. I also mentioned, just in passing, I want to remind this again. So the land of Shinar or land of Babylon or land of Chaldeans, all talking about the same thing. So no matter how you call that, so it's the same uh, th thing they're talking about. So it's basically it's a Babylon. So uh, the Lord gave, so I want to stress this point. So whenever you see some words highlighted, Please make a note. So I want to emphasize uh, some of this. So here, if you see, the Lord gave Jehoiakim, uh, king of Judah, into his hand. It is Lord. That means what does it tell us? So it is the Lord is sovereign. So he rules over the earth. So he is sovereign. And he gave Jehoiakim, Judah, uh, of Judah, into his hand. That is, into King Nebuchadnezzar's hands. With some of the articles of the house of God which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God, uh, and he brought the articles into the treasure's house of his God. So remember, these are the valuables. So what he did was he took, he picked up that a good-looking young man, highly talented, royal people, royal uh, children from the royal families, and then he also went to the temple of God and he picked up all the, uh, the uh, goblets, all the, the treasure from the treasure house, what are the choices to things, whatever he wants, he picked all that. That is what he is doing here. And he took all that to Babylon. 
but in the second deportation when uh, Jehoiachin was taken with the 10,000 and Ezekiel uh, and uh, in that time the, he also took a lot of other stuff. So first time he didn't take all that but second time he took a lot more, a lot more uh, stuff from the temple. So that's Daniel chapter 1 verse uh, 2. So the king instructed Aspenaz, the master of his eunuchs, uh, to bring some of the children of Israel and uh, some of king's uh, descendants and some of the nobles. So here is the uh, uh, command the king gave to Aspenaz. Uh, so this guy, Aspenaz, is the master of uh, uh, the, his eunuchs uh, to bring some of the children of Israel. So this is so. Uh, let me uh, pause and uh, do one more thing. Chapter one is a kind of a summary. So it basically what chapter 1 is doing is Daniel is writing a summary of all his years in Babylon. So he is, he, first he said, I was taken captive, I was taken to captive with, uh, uh, about the, he talked about the first deportation, right? And then he also talked about uh, utensils from that uh, uh, large temple was taken. And now what he is saying is, now the, the way he was uh, taken is this is by the instruction that is what he was explaining so by that by the time we complete this chapter that gives a clear summary the reason i am saying this chapter is a summary of the book of daniel is at the end he says i uh, he was there until the period of cyrus uh, the persian so that gives a kind of a summary of course in this summary he is not writing about the visions in the summary, he is not talking about uh, uh, the dreams and all that, but he is just giving a high overview in this chapter. So now let's go back to verse 3. Then the king instructed Aspenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of his children of uh, Israel and some of the king's descend descendants and some of the nobles. So that is how uh, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they all were taken uh, from, uh, the, uh, from Judah. So who is this guy, Aspenaz? So it says master of his eunuchs. Some of your translations, English translations may say uh, chief of the officers, the chief of stewards and all that kind of uh, stuff. So, but let me explain. This eunuch is a separate term that was used especially in the Bible. Um, so what they do is they do castration to um, uh, um, some males and then they use as uh, guards, especially in the kingdom. So we'll see what what happened here. So here is a description of an eunuch. It says a castrated human male from remote uh, antiquity. Eunuchs were employed in the Middle East and in China in two main functions. They are fun uh, their functions are as guards and servants in harems or other women's quarters as a chamberlains to kings. So the, basically what they do is they take this man and then they castrate them and so that they will not have you know, children or families or anything. And then they will put them in places like where the, you know, they can be a guards and uh, things like that. So that is what a eunuch basically is. So here the chief of the eunuch um, took Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego into his hands. So now... When we look at uh, how do we know that Daniel was uh, uh, taken like that? So in Isaiah, I think I alluded to this passage before. Uh, then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when, that is, uh, when all that is in your house and that with your fathers have stored up till this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. I'm not going to repeat all that what I said in the previous sessions here. So the context is when there was a Babylonian delegation, Hezekiah the king took all this Babylonian delegation and showed his entire house and all that. At that time, Isaiah said, whatever you are showing in your house, you will be taken one day to Babylon. So the point now I want to stress is the verse 7. In verse 7 it says, uh, and some of your own sons who will come from you, uh, whom you will father shall be taken away and they shall be eunuchs in, in the palace of the king of Babylon. So keep this in mind. So Isaiah was prophesying way back when, when Hezekiah was the king. So this was like 150 years or uh, even before around that time. So uh, when Isaiah says this, this is the fulfillment what we are seeing now, right? So this is the fulfillment exactly what we are seeing uh, with the Daniel you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were taken and were given to eunuchs, and this is exactly that is what Isaiah prophesied. Your sons will be taken. 
so the, when the bible ta- when the bible says sons so bible says uh, sons but the ba- the meaning is it need not be as immediate son it may be a uh, grandson it may be uh, their forefathers so even that kind of a language is used in the gospels when you see uh, you know the people were calling jesus the son of david of course david king david was like you know uh, uh, several hundred years before but they call him the son of david so i just want you to keep that in mind by uh, in the ancient languages they usually use if they don't want to mention in between all these other uh, people they just say the son of whoever they want to talk about a particular king so here we are talking about their your own sons we are talking about hezekiah here and now we are referring to daniel shadrach meshach and abednego so it is a prophecy fulfilled uh, from daniel uh, to uh, uh, from isaiah to daniel so now here again going back to daniel chapter 1 verse 4 young men in whom there was no blemish but good looking gifted in all wisdom possessing knowledge and quick to understand who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the chaldeans so now how do you know they are good of course good looking you can see them and pick them out these are best specimens from the kings uh, uh, from the family in judah but how do you know their uh, their ability i believe that they might have given some kind of an iq uh because uh, later on you see king also tested these people after their training so they, i think the, they figured out these guys are very t- talented so they picked them up and then they put them in a pl- palace for a training and for three years they have to be trained in the language of babylonian in the culture and in everything uh, that related to the babylons here we talked about how do we get this knowledge or the wisdom so i just want to take a small detour and explain to you about the wisdom bible talks about so here we look at the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom bible talks about in proverbs chapter 9 verse 10 it says the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom that means the fear is not just like trembling and running away this is a reverential fear so you honor you respect you fear the lord and that is the beginning of wisdom i have not seen one person who really fear the lord uh, has uh, like you know got into a trouble or anything like that so the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy one the knowledge of god is understanding so proverbs 9 10 clearly says the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy one is understanding if someone want to really be uh, gain wisdom so this is what the bible prescribes and the bible also talks about the opposite the fool said in his heart there is no god so the bible is very clear bible says that you know so one way uh, you respect god you fear god you gain wisdom but on the opposite side it also says a fool has said in his heart there is no god they are corrupt they have done abominable works there is none who does good psalm 14:1 clearly says okay so here is a situation like if i don't have the fear of god i want to do whatever i want right so uh, uh, they, they are corrupt they they have done abominable works because they they re- they respect nobody so when there is no god in their life and one of the reasons actually is the people do all kinds of stuff walking away from god is they don't want anybody to uh, oversee them even god so that is why they come up to an idea say that there is no god but bible also says that deep down in their heart they know that there is a god bible clearly says that every person knows that deep down in their heart that there is a god i think it is blaise pascal mathematician he said that there is a, a vacuum in a, a everybody's heart that only god can fill so that's why people go to this pilgrimages and all this because there is some vacuum they want to find even look at the people those who are in very remote corners nobody had told them anything but yet they go and worship something so they want they are in a seeking uh, god as uh, some kind of a power so even those people those who reject god but bible says deep down in their heart they know that there is a god so that is what we call natural revelation so uh, uh, bible also says for since the creation of the world his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and godhead so that they are without excuse 
so nobody could go and stand before god and said oh god i don't know that you are there i don't know that you know you existed bible says that just the creation will tell that there is a higher power there is a super, supreme being so there is and the bible also says that they are without excuse that is that tells really very clearly and i think i don't have time to go in that direction and explain all that you know bible also says the heavens declare the glory of god you just look at the you know i was always amazed and uh, sometimes we visit uh, uh, kennedy space center we actually took a an annual pass every time i go there one of the things that i do is that to, to look at that uh, there is a 3d movie about with the hubble telescope you know so uh, it's mind boggling like, like you know you go uh, there you are not measuring the distances in miles you are measuring in light years that means the light traveling for one year so look at the distance and everything in the light years it's amazing even with that kind of a distance as you go still we have not reached the end so there is still uh, things to find but anyway that's a side track so uh, even without the hubble telescope sam is right the heavens declare the glory of god and so uh, back to our uh, text here so in verse 21 it says because they knew god as i said they knew god they did not glorify him as god nor were thankful that is why bible tells in everything you thanks because it is the god who provides us it is the, if you are taking breath think about that you know it is god who gives us the breath so uh, we need to be thankful god you gave this you you are the sustainer and provider of this so if god wants to take everything away from us it doesn't take for him a second you know so he can just take it any time so what it says is here we need to be thankful but if you deny god if you say there is no god then that's what it says they did not glorify him as god that's the first point and then the second it says nor were thankful but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened because the moment you reject god satan takes the uh, very good strong hold uh, in their lives and then verse 22 professing to be wise you know sometimes you look on the tv and you know watch this some people come and talk and they profess to be wise you know they have all these phd's and they have all kinds of things but then bible says professing to be wise they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible god into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things so they they are what god is saying is they are changing the glory of incorruptible god god is so big and so majestic and they are changing that god into an image that they can think of they can make and people need to understand things so i give us uh, some kind of uh, explanation like this if you make a bread or a chapati i can uh, tell them like you know if you make that is that thing that you made is bigger than uh, greater than you or are you, are you the greater so uh, the point i'm trying to make is god created us and he is uh, great so we cannot go and create a god and say that okay you are greater than me because you are the creator So anyway I think I made the point across so let me go back you can find this in Romans chapter 1 uh, 20 and 23 I would actually encourage uh, you to go back and read Romans chapter 1 it also deals with a lot of other things so the uh, it talks also about the homosexuality it also talks about why they are behaving like that it is all because God rejected them God said okay I'm giving up on you so that is the reason bible explains why they are doing the way they are doing so uh, but anyway that is outside the topic for us today so the romans chapter 1 gives a detailed description on that so coming back to daniel chapter 1 verse 5 and the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank and three years of training for them so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king so three years full fledged training and after three years they will stand before the king and they will serve in the king's court in the palace so that is what king uh, asked them to do so but here uh, look at the uh, verses uh, the highlighted portion of this verse king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank just if in a normal course like you know if you um, let's say if you go to washington dc and uh, the white house says that you can dine in the white house you know so the uh, the chef will uh, prepare meals for you and uh, you can just eat at the president's table every day so you know what kind of royalty is that or you know buckingham palace wherever it is you know so 
So that is what here these people are provided the food right from what kings eat, king eats. You know, so it is the made of the the best food in the world. You can say that. So that is what they were given here. We need to understand the kings, what kings actually eat, or at least the Babylonians eat uh, at the time. So let me uh, look at this. Many of the foods e uh, eaten at the Babylonian court includes could include pork or horse flesh would have been unclean uh, according to the law of Moses. So now you have to step into the shoes of Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego, right? So now these people, these, these boys, these young men, they actually they were teenagers when they were brought to Babylon. So these were following the law of Moses. We can clearly say that they are the God-fearing uh, young men. So for them to violate the law of Moses is sin. So either they, would, they are ready to die, but they don't want to sin, right? So with that background, so now when they were given the king's food, they were in trouble. Like, you know, how can we eat this? The, at least the Old Testament says that we, we shouldn't be eating all this. For example, the blood might not have been drained from the meat. I am giving references. I am not taking you there and reading because once I start doing, then there will we'll be completely going back to reading something else. So I gave you references. If you want, you can read in Leviticus chapter 11. In Leviticus chapter 17, verse 13 and 14, it gives the dietary laws from the law of Moses. So every faithful Jew would follow all these dietary laws. The, uh, so they don't want to eat anything that is not mentioned or prescribed by the law. So otherwise they would be become ceremonially unclean. So to eat such foods would have been a sin for an Israelite and would have rendered the individual ceremonially unclean before God. So they don't want to do that. So now they are uh, in, a in a big dilemma, right? So now on one side, you are supposed to eat from king's table, but then this food is ceremonially unclean. So how, how, what to do with this? So the meat and the wine would have been undesirable uh, because of a portion of it was at least on occasions uh, if it not always first offered sacrificially to Babylonian gods. The first reason I gave you, so it could be the, the, the law of the Moses. And then the other reason here we see is sometimes the food was sacrificed, uh, offered to the, uh, the Babylonian gods. And again, participating in that would uh, amount to uh, idol worship. So that is why they, want, they, uh, they had to be careful with that. Although wine was not forbidden uh, by the Jewish law, Daniel's aversion to drinking it probably is to be explained by its use as a libation in these pagan rituals. They use it in uh, these pagan rituals and uh, he don't want to partake in that. So partaking of this food would have been an indirect act of worshipping the Babylonian de uh, deities. So here you see, so eating this food is now violating his law. So violating the law of Moses. So he is now in a place where he had to decide. So thus, Daniel's refusal to eat the king's food was based upon his deep religious convictions. He decided to remain true to his God. So that is why um, we see uh, in the other verses he rejected that food. So now in, let's go, go back to verse 6. Now from among those sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and uh, Azariah. So we, whenever we talk about Daniel and his friends, we always say Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So that's how it goes, right? So because of some songs that were written, because of, you know, all that uh, history, the tradition and all that. But that actually those, those are not their real names. So the real names were Daniel uh, and then Hananiah and Mishael. See, th those are their real names. Daniel, Hananiah, and Mishael are the real Hebrew names. To those Hebrew names, as I said, they want to brainwash, they want to change their name, they want to, everything has to be changed, right? So now, here in verse 7, to them, the chief of the eunuchs gave names. So he gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar. Don't get confused with Belshazzar. Belshazzar was the, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. So that is when the handwriting on the wall we talked about or we are going to study in chapter 5 one more time. So that is a different king, a uh, different name. So here Daniel was called Belteshazzar. And uh, to Hananiah and Shadrach, 
So Hananiah they gave Shadrach and to Mishael they gave Meshach and to Azariah they gave Abednego. So these are the names. They changed the names from uh, Hebrew names to Babylonian names. So you can read that in Daniel chapter 1 verse 6 and 7. So what does actually Daniel, the meaning of Daniel means? You know every time in the Hebrew every name has a significant meaning. So and it is amazing the, we can go on a different uh, route and even the study of the names in the Genesis it actually gives some meaning even with their names. Uh, so Daniel means God is my judge. So that is uh, the meaning of uh, Daniel. And Hananiah means Yahweh being gracious. Yahweh is the Hebrew Jewish God so Hananiah means uh, God is gracious. God has been gracious. And uh, Mishael means who is what God is. So in other words, who is like who is like this God? And uh, Azariah means Yahweh has help. So these names tell us that they are deeply into their uh, religious beliefs and uh, uh, their parents might have named them uh, um, hoping that they will grow in that kind of a godly uh, way of life. Yeah, actually this happens even with other religions. you know they, they put they give their names. Uh, close to their deities, you know, so that is how these names were. Uh, Daniel, God is my judge, Hananiah, uh, Yahweh has been gracious, Mishael, uh, or sometimes this is also called a Michael, who is what God is, and uh, Azariah, Yahweh has helped. So those are their Hebrew names and their meanings. So now you look at, uh, so they got the Babylonian names, so Daniel got a Belteshazzar. So Belteshazzar, Bel is their uh, local god, Bell protects his life. You see how it's now changed everything. So Bell protects his life. And Shadrach uh, means command of Aku. Aku is another moon god. And uh, other name Meshach, who is as Aku is. So, and then Abednego, slave of the god Nebo. So uh, Nebuchadnezzar's uh, favorite deity was the Nebo or Nabu. So now these names were given uh, to these people. Um, so now from Hebrew names, now they have the Babylonian names. For some, because Daniel is writing this book, Daniel preferred to use his name as Daniel. So I'm going to explain when we come to chapter 2 how he has to specifically say Daniel and then King Nebuchadnezzar also will mention Belteshazzar so, to know, so that the people will know. So for example, if you walk into the palace, you call Daniel, nobody knows who Daniel is because he was Belteshazzar. Even king calls him Belteshazzar. But because of his uh, religious beliefs, it appears to me that Nebuchadnezzar um, might have called Daniel a Daniel in some occasions. So that's why the clarification in the chapter 2, he writes both the names. But now when we get to other people like you know, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they were basically all the time called with the Babylonian names. And so, but anyway, okay, so now here is my question. Is it sin for them to change their names? So the, is, does that violate the law of Moses? So now here, they were given Babylonian names. They did not resist. You see, they, they did not resist these names. So they were, uh, they took the names, they took all that, the culture and everything. So as I mentioned about the, when it comes to the, now, uh, food, then there was some resistance, but look at the other things. So, giving new names as a sign of new ownership, uh, a common court practice. So, once you change the name, you remember when I mentioned this in the previous sessions, even king went there and changed the names from Elo, uh, Eliakim to Jehoiakim and, you know, names like that. You know, they want to even change the name so that they feel uh, uh, new ownership. So, sometimes we see this under new management, you know, so some uh, restaurants or some businesses they come up with, you know, so it's the same place but under new management. So, that's some kind of a name change here. So, giving new names as a sign of new ownership, a common court uh, practice. So, I gave the names side by side here, the Hebrew name and the Babylonian name, Daniel Belteshazzar, uh, Hananiah, Shadrach and Mishael Ma Meshach and Azariah Abednego. So from now on, so just keep this in mind, we will be calling Daniel, Daniel, because if we say Belteshazzar, most of the Christians even don't know who that guy is, because we are all familiar with Daniel. 
But then when we call Hananiah, the Hebrew name, they don't know who Hananiah is. They know they are familiar with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So that means what I'm saying is Daniel from Hebrew name slot, and then the rest of the three names picking up from Babylonian name slot. So that's what we are going to see, and that is how we are used to studying these names. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So now you see one name from Hebrew side and the three names from the Babylonian side. So those, uh, that is how these names were uh, traditionally uh, familiarized to us. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. In the previous verses, we said that king ordered that these people were fed from his table. The king ordered that these people were uh, fed with whatever he eats, right? So, but in verse 8, it says, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. What a, what a young man. So, he has already made up his mind, okay? So, no matter what the situation is, he do not want to defile. The reason for that is, you want to change my name, that's fine. I don't care because the law of Moses does not prohibit him to change his name. You want to maybe shave his head, I don't know. I'm just throwing all this out. So, no, I don't care. You want to change my dress and you know the way I you know you look at in Genesis Joseph was uh, also uh, he was wearing uh, Egyptian clothes he even became an Egyptian prime minister there so this so what I'm saying here is Daniel did not bother in all other areas as long as it did not violate the law of Moses so when it comes to the law of Moses now he says, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies nor with the wine which he drank. So therefore, he requested of the chief of uh, uh, eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now I want to take again a small detour about uh, defiling and undefiled. Bible talks about this extensively about how a person can be uh, keep themselves so holy. So Daniel might be aware of some of all this. Uh, so uh, in Psalms, it says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way, who walk in the law of the Lord. So that is what exactly Daniel is doing. If he is following the law of the Lord, whenever he talks about the law of the Lord, that means, especially in the Old Testament, the law is the law of Moses. In verse 2, Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. That is what these boys were doing. So they wanted to follow the Lord, no matter where they are, whether where they are in Babylon, whether they are in uh, uh, Judah, or wherever they are, they want to follow the Lord. So, the, in verse 3, they also do no iniquity, they walk in his ways. So, in Psalm 119, very good Psalm, you know, uh, very good uh, uh, instructions given in Psalm 119. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity, they walk in his ways. So, uh, that is what actually we see uh, uh, the, Daniel and his friends were doing. And also it talks about how can an young man cleanse his way. In other words, how can an young man keep his way pure? So here is the solution for that. In the same Psalm 119 verse 9 it says, How can an young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. So you open the Bible, you open God's word, you open the law of Moses. Or For them it is the law of the Moses or the Old Testament the Torah. So by taking heed according to your word, that is how you can uh, an young man can cleanse his way. As long as you stay close to the word of God, you will run away from evil. So that's why it also like, you know, if a person walks very closely, like studying the Bible and praying, they will stay away from trouble. But the moment they leave, um, you know, they reject the Bible or forget to read and slowly they will just go away. It, it will not happen overnight, you know. So the more, the, the more they keep rejecting the word of God and this, stop going to church, they stop reading the Bible, you know, they get into trouble. So here it clearly says that how can an young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to your word, that's God's word. With my whole heart I have sought you, oh, let me not wander, wander from your commandments. So your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. So this is very interesting. This is the one you know, we all need to underline, even in our lives. You know, so temptation is can come to anyone. So sin is uh, waiting uh, to pull us down any time. So the, no, nobody is immune to that. The only way, the only way 
we can stay close to, uh, stay pure in the sight of god is to stay uh, close to his word so it uh, in verse 11 it says your word i have hidden in my heart that i might not sin against you so the more you uh, keep god's word in your heart the more you more you dwell the more you meditate upon god's word um, so that's how an young man can cleanse his way and it applies to us even so psalm 119 uh, 9 to 11 and uh, again going back to daniel chapter 1 verse 9 uh, to 10 it says now god has brought daniel in the favor and good will of uh, the chief of the eunuchs so here he is the, the chief of the eunuchs is the one given responsibility to take care of these young men right now you look at this verse god had brought daniel into the favor and good will of uh, the chief of the eunuchs gave him uh, sympathy towards these guys Uh, in the eyes of the chief of the eunuchs so now here is the uh, the situation here verse 10 and the chief of the eunuchs said to daniel i fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink for why should he see your faces looking worse than the young man who are your age then you would endanger my head before the king nebuchadnezzar whoever knows nebuchadnezzar they only know one thing if something if nebuchadnezzar gets mad their head will be head will be rolled off you know so that's what so that this guy he knows exactly what what is going to happen if king finds that these people are not eating from king's table and if king sees that these people are not like the other people or the, they, their faces looking worse or something like that then you would endanger my head before the king so the chief of the eunuch said that but you have to go back and look at verse 9 god has brought daniel into the favor and good will of the chief of the eunuchs in a typical situation these if you look at this these are actually a captives from a different country uh, so in other words these are slaves so they were just brought from a different country and whatever this kingdom orders them to do they have to do it so now daniel requested that they don't want to eat this food and god has brought daniel into the favor and good will of the uh, chief of the uh, eunuchs so daniel said to the steward uh, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over daniel hanania mishael and uh, azariah so this is what daniel said please test your servants for 10 days here is a test again daniel is actually giving the test now <laughs> so please test your servants 10 days and let us give them you know, veg- vegetables to eat and water to drink we don't want all this king's food the beet and all that we because we don't know how they might be sacrificed or they are not done properly according to our law we don't want to violate our laws so give us vegetables or just some pulses in some translations it says some pulses some grain whatever it is so nothing you know, that will not break the law of moses and give us some water to drink so that, that this is what daniel is proposing please test your servants for 10 days so here he is asking only for 10 days it seems reasonable for even for this uh, stewards so for 10 days okay why not we give you uh, vegetables why not we give the uh, uh, water right so that is what uh, uh, daniel uh, was requesting verse 13 then let our appearance be examined see he is so confident in the god he serves he is giving a challenge okay 10 days I'm not going to eat the king's food but just give us some vegetables after 10 days you can examine us you, so let's examine our appearance and then you can decide if you think that we are worse faring so then you can take away this and then give the king's delicacies so that is what in verse 13 it says then let our appearances be examined before you uh, uh, and the appearance of the young man who ate, uh, ate the portion of king's delicacies and as you see fit so deal with our your servants so This is the request Daniel is making to the uh, chief of the store or the eunuchs. So he cons- uh, consented with them in this matter and tested them 10 days. Again, why did he burge or why did he consented? Because God showed favor. So verse 9, you have to go back and see that God showed favor. So now, so verse 14, so he consented with them in this matter and tested them 10 days. Verse 15, at the end of 10 days, their features appeared, what? Better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. So there has to be a blessing. So no matter, you know, there has to be a blessing even in the food. So here we see that God is blessing them 
even when they are eating just the vegetables or water or drinking water and at the end of 10 days they are actually much better than the other people so you know that is what happened here in 14 and 15 verses so in verse 16 thus the uh, steward took away their portion of the delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables for as this uh, four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in the literature and wisdom, and Daniel has understanding in all visions and dreams. As I told you, this chapter 1 is a summary, so he's wrapping up this uh, uh, thing. Now he had this test, he had this 10-day uh, uh, test, and he looked better than with other people. And verse 17, not only that, God gave them knowledge and skill in the literature and wisdom and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. So it is God who gives uh, understanding and uh, all this. So verse 18, now at the end of the days when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them. So now he is fast forwarding three years. He is fast forwarding because the training was for how many years? Three years, right? So now here in verse 18, now we're at the end of the days. That is at the end of the training. Now we're uh, supposed to be graduating now. So when the king had uh, said they should brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them and among them, all none were found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they served before the king. So they passed the interview. They passed whatever king asked. And uh, in fact, they found they are much better than all other people. And the king employed them and they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king uh, examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in his realm. So it is not that now the comparison is not between the other kids or other people who are bought from uh, the other places. So uh, he, he now he is actually comparing with the other people, professional people here. The, these are the magicians, the astrologers in his realm. So he actually found them ten times better than the other professionals in his uh, palace. And thus... Uh, Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. Now, he was brought um, uh, when he was like around uh, 15 years and now until the uh, uh, King Cyrus, the first year of King Cyrus, that is how long, the 70-year Babylonian captivity. Daniel was there in the court of Babylon. Not all the time in the palace because uh, we are going to study in chapter 5 the other things that what happened. He has to brought, brought back from retirement, but of course he was still in Babylon. But then he was employed back uh, uh, in, into job by King Cyrus. So now as we look at this verse 21, this is clearly tells us this chapter 1 is a summary. So chapter 1 gives starting with Babylonian captivity until the end of that captivity which happened in the king uh, at the time of King Cyrus. So the, in summary, let me recap what we have uh, done uh, today. So Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So here, here on, as I said, I will be also using the same name so that we are all familiar. Uh, Daniel name is a Hebrew name, but Shadrach, Meshach, and uh, Abednego are uh, uh, Babylonian names. So when I was preparing or uh, sometimes when I was studying this, I, I kind of like, you know, if you go to some places, people name their kids like Shadrach or Meshach and Abednego. So they thought that these are Bible names, right? So, of course, it's in the Bible. But honestly, if you look at the meaning, these are not anything to do with the, uh, the honoring God. So in other words, I'm telling you, don't name your kids Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego if you're really following what the meaning says. Uh, so that is what it is. Of course, Daniel is a Hebrew name. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was a Babylonian names. So these four young men were brought here. Uh, are there any other people along with these people? We don't know. There may be more people. Uh, looks like the, there were more people. Uh, with this group but our focus at least Daniel's focus in writing this was only on these four people so we don't know if there were more people at the time um, and of course there will be more people just like you know so just like uh, Nebuchadnezzar went to Judah and bought these people right 
he also might have went to egypt he also might have went to assyria so look at the carcomit uh, the war at car so there were other people also in this training so it is not just this four people or maybe only from juda but i suspect there were other people from other regions also there so but our focus of course is now only on this young uh, young men from juda so this four men daniel shadrach meshach and abednego were brought from juda and they were trained in the babylonian culture and they were given babylonian names and all that and then uh, during that time daniel want to be faithful to the law of his god and he don't want to defile himself and uh, that's why he requested to eat vegetables and you know um, and drink water instead of uh, defiling himself by the king's meat or the food that was offered to idols or that was strangled and uh, you know the animals that were strangled and not the blood was not drained properly according to leviticus so he do not want to violate any of the leviticus laws given by moses so uh, but then even with all that so they uh, he, they were found uh, much more better in health uh, compared with the other people so finally they were given that and then in the final exam they aced everything so he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm uh, thus daniel uh, uh, continued until the first year of king uh, cyrus we will continue in chapter 2 and then there was a dream and then we are going to see the, the golden image and then we are going to study the fiery furnace so there were some challenges when these people were given some promotions other people were not happy and they were jealous of these four people they were trying to set them up so they were trying to set them up and in one case actually they were thrown into the fiery furnace of course they were uh, saved from that we are going to study all that and thank you for watching and uh, if you are not subscribed to this channel please do subscribe and also if you like this video please give a like on the video and uh, here is my youtube channel address uh, youtube slash uh, dr john reddy and also i do blog and i also i write some questions and answers uh, that come to me so you can also visit my blog uh, thank you for watching see you next week